Praise the Lord. Welcome again. Cross Life Fellowship, Tuttle, Oklahoma. Thursday evening, I keep wanting to say Wednesday. Thursday evening Bible study. I want to welcome anybody who's listening uh, later on through YouTube or other places where we might be able to get the message out through uh, Dynamite Radio on the web or Facebook or wherever else it might go. The website, crosslifefellowshipchurch.com, I think is what it is. So, Anyway, we're studying in Romans. We've been in the book of Romans for several months, or several, yeah, probably several months now. We've been looking in the book of Romans, like I, I say, most every Thursday evening. We're, we're studying the book of Romans with the intent of taking the gospel to the world around us. And by the world around us, just to remind us and remind those who may have, may be, have been listening or may just be brand new listening, that world around us is those that we come in contact with each day, whether it's our family and friends or co-workers or the grocery store or whatever it might be, this world needs the gospel. We need to be taking, that is the answer, we need to be taking this answer. You know, a lot of times it's been likened that uh, if you were a doctor and you had the cure for cancer, it would be a shame, it would be basically, it would be criminal for you if you had the answer to withhold that answer from those that needed the answer. And see, what we have today in the gospel, what we have today through what Jesus has provided for us at Calvary is the answer to, if you will, the cancer in the heart of man. And that is sin. And I'm going to sin is a cancer. We've used multiple times the analogy of if you were to take a brand new pickup or vehicle and set it in a field and you scratched it and, and, and eventually that scratch would turn to rust on that metal and that rust would begin eating that metal over time, it would destroy that vehicle. And that's what sin is like in our hearts and life. It may be just a little bit here and there, but the Word of God tells us it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. But it, it, that, that sin in the heart of man, from the time that we're born, we're born in sin. We are born dominated by that sin nature. You go back to our teaching there on Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and such, and, and you see that, that we are born in sin and that the only remedy for that sin is the blood of Christ. It, it is the only, the only thing that God has that He has given that if you will can cleanse that rust of sin, that stain of sin, that, that, that ever-consuming uh, effect of sin in our hearts and lives is the blood of Jesus is the answer. And if you know that answer and you withhold that answer from somebody, like I just said, that's a criminal, that could be considered a criminal act. Why would we want to withhold that? which we have known that's cleansed our sin, given us new life. We don't, we don't want to withhold that from those that we come in contact with. Amen? Amen? And that's what we've been looking at Romans here with the intent of taking the gospel to the world around us. Just, and like I've said pre, or multiple times, you know, we, we often think of, oh, when I take the gospel, they have to make a decision right now. They don't have to make a decision, right? They need to, but we don't need to go in there with, you're going to make a decision now because by golly, I'm just going to hammer it down on you. You know, we take this gospel to them. Sometimes it's like a baby. You can't feed the baby the whole, the whole jar of food at one time. It's a little bit here and there. And that's what we do. We, we, we feed them a little bit here and there. The Word of God talks about some till, some sow the seed, some water, but it's God that gives the increase. You know, we may be the one who tills in a life that breaks up that fallow ground. We may be one that just comes along and spreads some seed from time to time. We may be someone who comes along and gives the refreshing water of the Word to them from time to time. And, and it is God who will bring forth that, that seed that will produce and bring forth fruit. You know, it, it's the Holy Spirit that has to convict of sin. You see, too many times, and 
And as I said last week, we're going to start. Uh, uh, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit on Sunday mornings, and we're going to go through, and we're going to study the Holy Spirit, and we're going to see just who He is, and what He does, and how He works, and what makes it possible for the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and lives. The church, for the most part, has has kind of left that. They they're, they're not relying on the Holy Spirit. We've got to come back to the place to where we rely and we are dependent upon the Lord, on, on His Spirit to lead us and guide us. We have to have that leading and guiding because even as a born-again believer, we are inadequate within ourselves and of ourselves, by ourselves, to do anything for the kingdom of God, to take this gospel to the world around us. We are inadequate to do so in our own strength and ability, in our own understanding and knowledge and whatever else it might. I don't care if we've been to all the seminaries and got the doctor PhD degrees and all that stuff. We still need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can take this gospel to the world around us. The greatest PhD in the world, I don't care if he's a doctor PhD of divinity or whatever, he needs the Holy Spirit. He must be dependent and all his education is for naught if he doesn't understand that. You understand that? It doesn't matter how much we know if we don't have the power of the Spirit to bring it to us, to teach us, to lead us, to direct us, then all we got is a bunch of stuff up there. We've got to have the help of the Spirit. So as we're moving on here in Romans chapter 9, and you know, I, I considered it first not not going this far in Romans, but I, then I just thought we need to go ahead. There's only a few chapters left. We need to go ahead and finish this, about six more chapters or seven, and just see what the Lord has. And I'm glad we did because we need to be understanding that this is what we're running into in this world around us. You know, just as we see there in Romans 1, the condition of the heart of man, it, it's the same here, but... What, what we have here with Paul or the Holy Spirit showing us here is, if you want to look at it that way, it's religion. You're going to run into some religious people. You understand that? And, and we need to realize, and, and, and we, we say it all the time, you know, what we have in Christ, you know, Christianity is not a religion, so to speak, but it is about a relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. And what's, what's the difference in religion, and let's just say in Christianity and religion? And can Christianity become religion? Anybody got any thoughts on that? In religion, you have to earn. Yes. You have to work your way through. Yes, religion, and if you, if you think about it, yes. any, anything, it doesn't matter if it's Catholicism, it doesn't matter if it's Jehovah Witness, it doesn't matter Hinduism, Mormonism, uh, Islam, whatever it is, religion, and, and the world will say Christianity is a religion, but in, like we said, in reality it is not. It's, it's about a relationship. But religion is what man comes up with to reach God. And by that I mean man thinks it up and man says, well, you have to perform in a certain way. You have to do this, that, or the other in order to have favor with God, to be pleasing to God. That is religion. Okay, It's what we come up with in our own hearts and minds and say, oh, I have to do this, that, and the other for God to accept me. That's religion. The relationship that we can have with our Heavenly Father, what Christianity is about, is about that relationship and it all has to do with what God has done to reach us. What God has provided in Christ. If you, if you think about it, there is no religion on the face of the earth. Muhammad's son didn't die for you. Muhammad didn't die for you. He didn't shed his blood to wash away your sin. Uh, Buddha didn't do it. Harry Krishna didn't do it. Whoever they are, Joseph Smith or whoever it was that started whatever religion, they did not give their lives that you could have relationship with God. 
And that's what separates religion from Christianity. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Romans will tell us that, that, in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we could care less about God, when we didn't give Him another thought. Paul will say it here in a minute in, 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 in chapter 9 here somewhat. When we didn't even have any thought for God, He sent His own Son. And actually, even before the foundation of the world, Peter tells us, that, that God foreordained that Christ would be that sacrifice before God ever created man. He, he knew man would fall and he already had a solution to that fall. He knew man would sin. We like to say fall, but you know, really it's sin. Yes. You know, fall kind of uh, cushions the blow, but it's sin that, that man had, that, that Adam did. Adam sinned against God, against what God had said and it plunged the entirety of the human race into that sin and separation from Him. And so God provided the way. No other religion, no other thing that calls itself a religion. However, it gets kind of confusing there. Christianity is not a religion, but no other form. We'll just use it for... Yeah, there you go. That's a better way to say it. Belief. No other belief system did the God of that belief system reach down to us and say, here's the solution. But you see, in Christianity, God is the one reaching down, reaching out, reaching towards, calling to us. Hey, come over here. Hey, I have it for you. You know, <coughs> the God of Islam doesn't want a relationship with you. You know, He wants you to perform. He wants you to strap a bomb to you and go blow up the infidel, you know. The God of Jehovah Witness or the God of the Mormons or whatever it might be. You know, they want you to give money, time, stuff, whatever. They all want you to give to them. Now, that being said, we got to be careful because even in our denominations in Christianity, and, and a lot of times, even in our own lives, we have gone into that place to where it has ceased to be about relationship, what God has done for us, and it becomes about what I do for God. That's what the Jews ran into. That's what Paul's going to show us here in chapter 9. That's what happened with the Jewish people. God chose them. He, Like we said here a few weeks ago, He called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, an idol maker, you know, whatever reason it doesn't tell us, God saw something, he, he, he called to Abraham, and Abraham responded. Abraham knew those idols were nothing, and he was probably seeking God. He had probably heard about God from, his, from whoever, maybe somebody else, not his dad, because his dad was an idol maker, but Shem, Ham, or Japheth, you know, one of the three sons of, of, of Noah, Abraham was a descendant of them, and he, he had probably heard from them the story of Jehovah, the God creator. And so he was reaching out, or, or was probably, I mean, I ain't knowing the reason why God would have called him, but God called him to leave that that he was doing, leave his father's house and be separated. God called him to a relationship with him, and he, promised, he made promises to Abraham and to his seed. And see, even though... Abraham maybe not have necessarily understood what that seed was. You know, a seed, as I looked up the definition of that, a seed is a remnant that is left over. A portion that is left over. You know, when you plant a garden, sometimes if you want to save seed, you don't take all of the green beans that you planted and can them up. You let some of them dry out so you have seed to plant for the following year. And, and, and that's kind of what it is with the Word of God or with, with, with the Lord. He has a remnant. You take a remnant and carry it over. God has, has always had a remnant. Even among the Jews, there was always a remnant. And a remnant is only a small portion. You see, not all. I mean, as we've seen it here in, in the book of Romans, not all that say they are the children are really the children. Because with Abraham and the children of Israel, the people that, that God had called out, they got the idea that they were 
better than the rest of the people, the Gentile nations. The, the, the rest of the people were just Gentile dogs. They got that idea that they were better. And in reality, they made what, what Jesus would say, they call, he, he called it the Jews' religion. They made it about what they did to reach God rather than about the sacrifice. I'm going somewhere here. I hope I'm not losing anybody. But they made it about what they did to reach God rather than the sacrifice that God had established as the way and faith in that sacrifice. See, God said, I will provide. What did He tell Abraham on that mountain? Whenever you know, He said, or what Abraham told Isaac on that mountain, Isaac would say, here's the wood and here's the fire, and, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham told, told his son, he said, God will provide a sacrifice. God will provide himself a sacrifice. That's what it actually says. And, and, and if you realize that, he was the sacrifice. In Christ, God was that sacrifice for you and I. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the three in one. You see, God the Son gave His life for you and I that we can have fellowship with Him. And see, religion, the Jews' religion, became about what they did. God gave them the law, and we need to understand the law and, and how it came about. The law was God's standard of righteousness. He said, this is what I expect from you. If you're going to have relationship with me, you have to measure up to this standard. Nobody could. And because they couldn't, God was showing them, I have a sacrifice. I have provided the means of the sacrifice. And we covered a little bit of that, I think, last week or Sunday. And, 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 and talked about how that every sacrifice, whether it was the dove or the pigeon or, or whether it was the meal offering or a drink offering or the bull or the goat, whatever that sacrifice was, it always pointed to Jesus Christ. Those sacrifices, like we said, they had to be minutely inspected. They had to be perfect in every way because they were a representation of Christ. That was God's way. The law, it was righteous, it was just, it was good, it was holy. It did what God designed for it to do. It showed us, showed them that they couldn't do it on their own and that they needed the sacrifice to have fellowship with Him. But they took the law and, and, and the sacrificial system. They ignored the sacrifice and started just like we do. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm bringing this around. Like we do in our denominations today, we get to the place where we ignore the sacrifice. Our faith's no longer resting in Christ, who He is and what He's done. And it begins to be about all the good that we do. You know, we, we go mow grandma's yard or we go change oil in cars or, you know, hand out water on the street or we go preaching in Africa or we go preaching somewhere downtown or whatever. All those things are good things to do. But you see, where we get messed up is we think by the doing of those good things that God looks on us and He's just smiling down at us. You know, that's not right. Those good things, yes, they will be there. Like I said, Sunday, they will be there, but not. It, it won't be that we do the good to be in relationship and fellowship with Him, to be a believer, to be a Christian, but we do those things because we are. And like what we're studying here, that is because of who we are, because of what He's done for us, because we are saved, because we want to share this gospel. We want to take this remedy for sin to the world around us because we are saved. Then, because our faith is in the sacrifice of Christ, then we will take and, and we will go mow grandma's yard to, to, you know, or hand out water bottles or go witness on the streets or whatever. They, those are fruits of faith in Christ. Those, but where we mess up is we, the church today has done the same thing that Israel did. And I, I've said it here a while back. Israel was the church of the day, of that day. They were given God's word. They were to take His word to the world around them. 
and they got snotty nosed, stuck up, however you want to call it, thinking they were better than those Gentile dogs, and they got to the point where they wouldn't have anything to do with them. And see, we do we 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 got to be careful that we don't do the same thing, you know. But for the grace of God, yes. there go I. You know, had not somebody told me, I might be that guy down there in the gutter. I might be that guy, homeless or maybe in a big old house and lost as a goose, a drunk or whatever. You know, just because you're homeless don't mean you're lost, and just because you got lots of money don't mean you're saved and on your way to heaven. Talk to Nicodemus, and, or not Nicodemus, uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Go read that story. That'll tell you the difference there. But that's what Paul is talking about here in, in chapter 9. And what he's, he's showing us is that just because the Jews, those people had that heritage of being the flesh and blood children of Abraham, it did not make them children of God. What makes us a child of God? Faith. Faith in Christ and what He did for us on the cross. That is the only thing that makes us a child of God. So, you know, we, we covered verse 12 and, and 13. I don't know exactly where we left off, but we're going to pick up there in verse 14. You know, 12 and 13... It, 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 Paul is recounting what went on with, uh, with the birth of, of Jacob and Esau. And it says, he, you know, it says in verse 12, he says, It was said to her, speaking of their mother, that the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And I think we covered that last week. That word hated there is, is, actually means to have no regard for. And because Esau had no regard for the things of God, we covered that last week, then God wasn't, he had no regard for Esau. Esau could care less about the birthright. We covered that. He sold it for a, a bowl of soup or whatever it was. That was, a, that was the worth that he saw, the spiritual birthright that he had. He was a son of Abraham. I mean, he wasn't of the bond woman like uh, Ishmael was. He was in the Vlina. He was a bona fide 100% son, you know, grandson of Abraham all the way totally. And what Paul is bringing out here is the fact that even though he was totally 100% of the blood, you know, he wasn't of another mother. He was a brother of the same mother, you know, as, as Jacob was. But he still did not care for the things of God. And that is the, the thing that he's pulling out here. Esau didn't care about the sacrifice. He didn't care about the birthright. He didn't care about all those things. All he cared about was today, me, I'm hungry. Give me some soup here. You can have it all, brother. But see, Jacob, even though he was, his, you know, his name meant surplanter or heel catcher, even though he was a conniver and he was, he was, he was just rotten, however you want to call it. He still, in his heart, he had an affinity. He had a desire for the things of God. And you see, God knows our heart. He sees our heart. You know, even He knows our heart even more so than we do. He knows the in a, He knows every thought of our mind. You know, we're not hiding anything from Him. And that's basically what, what Paul was bringing out here. And, and the fact that where he says, Jacob have I loved and Esau I've hated. Esau had no regard for the Lord and the Lord said, go on about your bad self way. Do your own thing because that's your reward. And he says, what shall we say then? Verse 14, he says, what shall we say then? He's asking this as a question. He said, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. You know, what is the answer to this? Is God unrighteous? God forbid. God is never unrighteous. And see, we need to understand that in our life today. We may not have all the... We, we, we won't have all the answers for what's going on. You know, how, how come some things happen and, and bad things happen to good people and this goes this way or that goes that way? You know, we don't have all the answers. Our, our, our little 
finite minds can't understand it all. You know, we can't fathom it. But what God is looking for in us is just that simple faith. Just take Him at His word and just trust Him. Just say, Lord, I don't know. God, this seems like this, this nation today, God, it's a mess. What's going on in the church today, God, it's a mess. I don't understand it. God, I don't understand what's going on in my life. You know, let's just bring it down personal. Sometimes there's things that happen in our lives that God, why? And it's not wrong to ask Him. But you know, if He just remains silent or He doesn't say, then we just need to say, I don't know why, God, but I'm still going to trust You. See, sometimes things happen in our lives. Things come our way. The car wreck, the sickness, whatever it might be. And God is using those things to draw us closer to Himself. You see, the, the enemy, you know, if, if we go back and we look at Job, you know, in the first chapters of Job, it, 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 it says that Satan went before God, had to give an answer to God. He had to tell God, hey, what was going on? And God says, where you been and what you been doing? And he says, oh, I've been going to and fro and roaming throughout the earth and this, that, and the other, you know, just doing my thing, basically. And God points out Job. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Now listen to this. God is saying to the devil, you see Job over there? The devil didn't bring up Job. God did. And he says, yeah, but I can't touch him. You've got a hedge about him, God. God's got a hedge around his children. I want to tell you today, God's got a hedge around you and I. He's got a hedge around everyone whose faith and trust is in the sacrifice. He's got a hedge, a wall. That's what that hedge speaks about. It's a wall, a barrier, and the enemy can't cross it unless God says, Hey, have you concerted my servant Susie over here? And the devil says, Yeah, but I can't touch her. But God says, Okay, I'll let it down a little bit and you can go in there. Kenneth Wiest is a is a, uh, or he was, one of the greatest um, Greek scholars of the, what is it, 20th century, the 1900s, however you want to, I think he died in 1960s or something like that. But the way he puts it is that, that that hedge, that if you take a dot and you put a dot on a piece of paper and you draw a circle around it, we're that dot. The hedge is that circle around us. God is in coming. What does the Word of God say? It says, The angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear Him. So, using that, 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 that understanding of Job, God is protecting us. But sometimes God may say, Have you considered my servant over here? And the devil will say, Yeah, but I can't touch him. When our faith is in Christ and Him crucified, we looked at that armor of God here a couple of weeks ago. God is protecting us. God is keeping us. If we step outside of that protection, then we're fair game for the devil. And we can step outside of that protection that God has given. We can drop our guard, and sometimes it comes about unknowingly to us because our faith has been manipulated by somebody whether it's church or a friend or whatever, and our faith has been manipulated to where we're not trusting in Christ and Him crucified. What is it? Brother Ray was telling me uh, 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 um, Tuesday. There were a group of preachers on the news, on TV here in Oklahoma City, and they were telling people to have faith in the shot. Put your faith in that shot. That shot's going to keep you safe. And see, that's what happens a lot of times. It may not be that shot. It may be something else. And the preacher says, Oh, if you give me $100, God's going to give you $10,000. Put your faith in your giving. And we fall prey to that sometimes. Oh, that sounds so good. He uses the Bible. You know, he brings this out. And, and we get duped. What does he say? Who has bewitched you in Galatians? They put a spell because their words sound so good. And we get bewitched. We get spellbound and our faith moves. When our faith moves, we go outside of that circle. But see, it says of Job that he offered sacrifices daily for himself and for his children even, lest they had sinned. 
And so God saw that his faith was in that sacrifice, that sacrifice that pointed to Christ, and that's what was keeping him. But God said he would let down that hedge. And sometimes things come our way because God is allowing some things in our lives. But God always allows it with the, 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 the plan and the purpose to draw us closer to Him. And you see, that's how we need to understand when we go through trials and we go through difficulty and we're going to go through them. You know, this, this, life, this, this, this life is full of trials and troubles. We will. I don't, if we been, whoever we are, when you get saved, you're not going to walk through a bed of roses. You're not going to tiptoe through the tulips. It's not going to be pie in the sky and everything's wonderful and great. It's going to be tough because you know what? Your adversary, the devil, is seeking to devour you. He's trying to take you out. Yes, he's trying to steal your faith. And see, God is trying to build your faith. So whenever we go through these things, these trials and these tribulations, we can either get mad at God and quit, which some do, or we can say, God, I don't get it, but I know you're in control, and Lord, I'm trusting in you. I'm going to hold on to your hand and let you lead me through. See, that's what God, He's trying to build faith in us. Build trust. Lord, you paid for it at Calvary, whether it's healing, whether it's finances I need, whether it's understanding I need, or, or, or help with decisions, whatever. God, you paid for it that I might have that. Lord, I want to re let me receive what you've given me. Receive means to take it to ourselves, take it into ourselves. You see, we can respond to trials either by drawing closer to Him or saying, God turned His back on me and I'm walking away. That's pride. That's thinking I know more. And that's what Paul's talking about here. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Everything God does, He does for our good. He told us that in Romans 8. He said, For He said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What this is saying here, He says, I will have mercy on anyone, whoever He is, that I will show mercy to in the future. God is basically saying, I, can, I will show mercy to anybody I want to. I will show compassion to anybody who, will, who, 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 who is calling out to me, is what he's basically saying there. He says, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. What he's talking about here, it's not of him that willeth or him that runneth. He's talking about the doing of our hands. He's talking about the works of our hands. It's not of them that, that think, oh, because I'm, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that or I will do that or I will do this. <coughs> he says it's because of God. That mercy comes to us out of God's goodness, out of His grace, out of His love for us. He says, For the Scripture says, un says unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. What can we learn from that today? You know, we, we understand and we know, you know, the, the, what, what he's talking about there. He's talking about Moses and he's talking about Pharaoh. He's talking about that time of the Exodus whenever Moses went to Pharaoh and he said, God has said, let my people go. You see, the thing we need to understand here is in that day and time of the Pharaohs in, in Egypt, and that time that Moses went to them, those pharaohs had the idea of themselves and they propagated this, excuse me, this idea to the people. Part of the religion of the Egyptians of that day was that Pharaoh was God, that he was deity. They looked at him like he can do no wrong. He's the best in the world. He's going to take care of us. Sound familiar what they want to do today? Look to the government. That's basically what that was. And, and, and God is saying, I'm the one who put you where you're at. And I put you there, Pharaoh, because I was going to use you. You mean God uses the ungodly? Yes, He does. Do you know God uses the devil? 
He has a, the reason, you know, we want to say, why didn't God just wipe out the devil and stop all this? Because God has a reason. He's testing you and I. He wants to see who is going to be faithful. He wants to, you know, not that he doesn't know, but he wants us to see, you know. He's going to see who's going to love him because of what he's got planned for us in eternity. He's not just going to arbitrarily just push it out there for anybody and everybody. It's going to be those who love him. He's, he tested the angels and he tested man. And now he's in the process, if you will, of weeding things out. But he says, The scripture said to Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised you up. He allowed Pharaoh at that time to be in that position for a purpose. He said that I might show my power in you and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. You see, God has a reason. He has a purpose. You know, it wasn't that Pharaoh couldn't be saved, but Pharaoh had such a high idea of himself that he, he in essence, was saying, Who is this God? He didn't know Jehovah. He didn't know God. He said, I'm God, is what Pharaoh was saying. What do we do? You know, I've said it before. What we put our faith in, that is our God. You know, and we need to think about that because a lot of times, well, all the time, really, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about doing these good works and this thing and that thing and saying, oh, you know, I've had people tell me, oh, I do these things because it makes me feel good. You know, but we ultimately, our faith is in us or it's in the sacrifice that Christ has made. Whether we're doing good works, you know, if we're doing good works and we're thinking those good works earn us brownie points with God, our faith is actually in us. You know, we say it's in those works, which, you know, it can be. But ultimately, oh, it's because I did this. My faith is in me. You see, and that's, that's the, 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 the problem here. That's what the thing was with, with Pharaoh. Pharaoh trusted in Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought he was God. He thought he was somebody. And see, that's what we do as well. We think we're somebody. We, we have our trust in ourselves and God is saying, that ain't going to work. What did Jesus say in Luke 9, 23? He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And we've looked at that word and, and traced it back to its root origin. That word deny means to forsake faith in. So what's Jesus saying there in, in, in Luke chapter 9? He's saying, you've got to forsake faith in yourself. Take up the cross. What's the cross mean? It means we die to self. Paul would say, I die daily. He's saying, Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. I, the big I, needs to die. The big I needs to be laid aside. Put off the old man, he will say. You see, that's, that's what we run into. We either put faith in ourselves or we deny that faith in ourselves and put our faith in the sacrifice that God has provided. And that's what God's looking for. That's what God's trying to produce in us. We go through trials. I, you know, we brought that up just a minute ago. We go through trials and tribulations. You know, what's the world say when you're going through a problem or you're having difficulties? Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, you, what is a, a, a you can be a better you or, yeah, or you got this, you know. What is it I heard Obama say when he was president? We made this problem and we're going to fix this problem. We can do it ourselves. That's the attitude that God's trying to show us. Whatever the problem is, He's going to, he's going to bring it about to say, go ahead and see if you can do it. Yeah, you know, I used the, the deal with the scientist trying to say, oh, we can make a man. And God says, okay, let's see. And they go get in dirt and God has to say, whoa, wait a minute, go get your own dirt. You know, God made the dirt. He made the man from the dirt. These guys think they're going to make a man, but they're going to use God's dirt. Mm -mm. If you're so high and mighty, Pharaoh, go make your own dirt. You know, that, that's basically what he's saying here. He says, I used Pharaoh for the same purpose I've raised you up. I've allowed you to be where you're... 
God has allowed the powers that are to be where they are that he might show his glory in this earth. He's calling his people back to him today. He's calling you and I, whoever you are on, on YouTube later on, he's calling us back to himself. Just like he was calling to Pharaoh. If Pharaoh would have, had, would have repented and said, I'll let you go ahead, guys. Hey, I, your God is great. Do you realize every plague, the flies, the frogs, the blood, every plague that, that Moses called down that came on Egypt at that time was an assault against their false gods. Do you realize, if you do some study, where the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, at the place, I forgot the name of it, but at that place where they crossed the Red Sea, that's where the Egyptians had erected the biggest statue of their most greatest god was at that location, it said. And at that location is where God brought His people. The Egyptians following hot on their heels thinking, oh, they're at Raftoff Gilead or whatever that was. Raftoff I don't know, anyway. But they're right there. That's where God so-and-so is at. And He's going to show Himself powerful. What happened there at that Red Sea? Whoosh. God dried up the ground for His people. When the Egyptians tried to come after Him, God destroyed them. What did He tell His people? The, these Egyptians you see today, you ain't going to see them no more. And He did it at the place of their most powerful so-called deity there at that Red Sea. God will show Himself powerful. He will use things. He's going to use what's going on in this nation today to show Himself powerful to His people. He will keep us. He will keep us if we'll keep our faith in Him. He's trying to build faith in His people. He's trying to draw us closer to Him. He's calling out to us today, come and draw near. You see, what does Psalms tell us? It's a, Psalms 91, I think you girls were talking about it a little bit earlier today. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my rock. He is my refuge, my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. What is a refuge? What is a fortress? It's a place you run to in a time of trouble. He is, yes, our hiding place. Will we hide in Him? You know, He's drawing us to Himself. We can trust Him that He's going to take care of And we can rest. Because we've talked about that there in that psalm, that dwelling and that, that, that He that, that dwells and He that abides. It talks about laying down and going to sleep. In the midst of the storm going around us in this world today, in the midst of the storm of what's going on in our life today, we can look to our God. We can look to Him and we can have rest and peace knowing that He's got us that He's got us in His hand and He's taking care of us no matter what the diseases are coming, no matter what enemy is coming against us, that faith in that sacrifice that He's made for us, we can rest in it and He will keep us. Amen? We're going to stop right there, but keep looking to Him. Keep trusting in Him. Keep putting your faith in that sacrifice, He will keep you. He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank You, Lord, this evening. I thank You for Your Word. Father, I thank You, Lord, that every time we look to it, we turn to it, Father, that, Lord, You bring peace, You bring encouragement, You bring hope, Father. Lord, let us stay, Father, in that place of trusting in the sacrifice that you have provided for us at Calvary. Lord, don't let us be led astray. Lord, don't let us listen to anything, Father, that would turn us aside from that faith, Lord. Father, I'm asking that you would touch your people here this evening, Lord, that you would touch those that listen later on to YouTube, Father, that, Father, you would draw them to you. Lord, that they would see and understand and know, Lord, that these are but light afflictions, Father, that you... Have us, Lord, held in your hands 
and that you're keeping us, Father. Lord, go with us this evening, the rest of this week, Lord, that you be glorified and praised in our lives. Father, help us to realize and to, to, to recognize the opportunities, Father, that you give us to witness, Father, to that world around us, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.